Wait, remember Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures? It was a show full of friendship, heroism, and war? Yeah, you heard me right. I'm talking about a violent coup d'etat, resulting in an international political conflict with clashing revolutionary forces kind of war. And if that didn't catch your attention, I don't know what will. Uh, lately, I've been feeling pretty Pac-stalgic when it comes to the missing one slice of pizza-shaped yellow hero. Except for that time, he wasn't a hero. <laughs> Yeah, we don't talk about that anymore. But honestly, growing up, Pac-Man was everywhere. More specifically with video games, the hours I would put into the original, the Championship Edition DX, Pack and Roll on the DS, Pac-Man World, and I am so excited that we just got Pac-Man World Repack recently as a complete remake of that game. And as some of you know, I have a gaming channel coming soon. It'll be linked down below, and some of the Pac-Man games are something I definitely look forward to covering. So yeah, check that out if you're interested. But in general, I love Pac-Man. <laughs> Okay, maybe not as much as that guy, but still. Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures follows Pac and his spherical friends as they try their best to protect Pac-World from the evil ghosts that have escaped the Netherworld and the overlord of the Nether, Betrayus. Now you may be thinking, Jordan, how could anyone possibly make an engaging television show based around a concept as simple as Pac-Man? And to that I say, Good question. I would say let me know in the comments, uh, but the video just started and I'm gonna answer that for you. Uh, maybe. Mmm, chip and dip delicious! Now a word from our sponsor. Exter, the world's largest smart wallet brand. Efficiency, security, and style are Exter's mission statement, and that's what you get. The wallets are also made with premium environmentally friendly leather. And now for the first time, they have added vegan leather options. They're made with recycled materials sourced from scrapped car windshields. It's comfortable, it's convenient, and boom, access to all of my cards without having to dig them out through all the holders from my previous old wallet. It's quick, and the aluminum internal casing protects them against skimming, which plagues so many many people per year, so the RFID protection is a pretty nice safety to have. Using the Parliament family of wallets for my everyday use has genuinely been a breeze and honestly, I won't ever have to worry about purchasing another wallet ever again. The wallet is also made with premium environmentally friendly leather and fits nicely in my pocket that sometimes I forget it's there. Whew. It's there. But if it weren't, I'd still be able to find it thanks to the tracker. You hit this button on your phone then. Oh. There it is. <laughs> Silly me. It's solar powered and can last up to three months on a single sunny charge. To step up your wallet game, click my link down below in the description and check out the Labor Day sale for up to 25% off your purchase by using code JordanFringe at checkout. Thanks so much to Exter for sponsoring today's video. Ugh, impressive! <laughs> Jerry, video games are the latest craze to sweep the country and most of the world too. It is a cacophony of sounds from a symphony of electronics. Electronics is changing so rapidly. Video games fever has prompted a number of businesses try to cash in on that billion dollar craze. Part of the fascination is the way the games are designed. David Nichols likes to play Pac-Man. Pac-Man, Pac-Man, Pac-Man. This is the current craze game, Pac-Man. The Pac-Man arcade game was created by Teru Iwatani and released in Japan on May 22nd, 1980. At home gaming consoles had only just recently been invented, but they were not nearly accessible enough as they are today. So the arcade market was booming, but quickly becoming mainly a boys club. The majority of the games at the arcade too were marketed towards men as well, with heavy violence and mainly shooter-based games like Space Invaders. Iwatani wanted to add some diversity to the space, with a game that was brighter, more colorful, and not the theme of killing things. Targeting a female demographic partially, he decided to make the game surrounding the objective of eating, because if there's anything we know about women, it was that they be eaten. Am I right, fellas? Obviously, I'm joking, but wow, you know, I don't know how to continue from this. Well, regardless of his method and original thought process, something seemed to work because apparently everyone loves eating, not just women. Shocker, Pac-Man attracted all demographics and its success quickly skyrocketed. The objective of the game, if you aren't already familiar, is to make your way around a maze as a little yellow circle, eating dots and avoiding ghosts. If you manage to eat one of the larger dots, you're able to temporarily power up and eat the ghosts that you're trying to avoid. And don't forget the cherries, ever! Now obviously from there we got spin-offs and sequels and different iterations of what Pac-Man is and can be, but as far as where Pac-Man in general started at, uh, there you go.
the series was developed for television by Tom Ruger and Paul Rugg, not to be confused with Paul Rudd. They are a duo well known for their work in shows like Animaniacs and Freakazoid. The executive producer of the series was Avi Arad, who is the founder of Marvel Studios and ex-CEO since he stepped down from that role in 2006. Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures was first introduced in a teaser trailer at the 30th anniversary celebration of Pac-Man at an E3 panel in 2010. Three years later, the series premiered on Disney XD on June 15th, 2013, and ran for 52 episodes in total with two seasons. In some territories, the second half of season 2 was technically released as a season 3, but you know, semantics. We jump right into our story at a typical school day in which our protagonist, Pack, voiced by Aaron Matthews, attends said school. It's established that he is not very popular at the school and is made fun of for being afraid of ghosts, which are regarded as a bit of a myth around Peckopolis. Maybe he's not liked because his name is Pack, and everything on the planet of Pack World sometimes has the name Pack in it, like the city of Pacopolis. While lost in a maze, Pac accidentally opens the gate to the netherworld, unleashing ghosts across the Pac town. It just doesn't stop. The netherworld is where our main opposing force resides. His name is Betrayus, and he is the king of the nether realm, as well as all of the ghosts that live there. Throughout the series, Pac and his two friends, Cylindria and Spiral, along with the help of four ghost double agents, Pinky, Blinky, Inky, and Clyde, must protect themselves from the ghosts that want under their town and defeat each of Betrayus' evil attempts to destroy Pack, as he is the only singular threat to the ghosts. It's an easy concept to understand. If you've been a fan of Pac-Man and have played a variety of the video games in the franchise, you are well aware of the weird and bizarre stories, characters, and play styles that accompany them all. So this, this is completely fine. We'll be right back to Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. And now back to Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. Early on in the series, we learn that Pac is actually the last of his race as a yellow Pac worlder. The yellow worlders are regarded as superheroes, essentially, and they all possess the ability to eat ghosts, sending them back to the nether. Well, at least they used to be regarded as that before the entire species was wiped off the face of Pac world. What is a kid's show without a little touch of Pac world or extinction to it? The president of Pacopolis brings Pac to the Tree of Life. No, not the divisive Terrence Malick movie. This Tree of Life, which grows the power berries that Pac is able to eat to power up and consume ghosts. Because this is Pac's source of power, it's often one of the more targeted things in the series, next to Pac himself, of course. There's a minty ice berry which allows Pac to freeze things and fight with ice that he has formed. There's a kung fu berry which gives the user major martial arts skills. There's a Packzilla berry which allows the consumer to size up quite a lot. There's a rocket berry, bounce berry, chameleon berry, garlic berry, wizard berry, youth berry. There's like a berry for every everything, dude. A lot of these were the inventions of circumference, or just circum for short. Being a scatterbrained, Einstein-looking inventor genius extraordinaire, he quickly becomes a mentor and friend to the Pack group, and even hits it off with Pack's aunt. Soon he will be Uncle Cum, for instance. So Pack is the last of his kind, an orphan raised by his orange aunt. But he is also named savior of Pacopolis as the only Pack person that has the ability to defeat the ghosts. But he seems to be doing okay with it all and coping well. There's actually an episode where Pac and his friends are able to travel to the past, cleverly titled Pac to the Future, in which Pac is able to spend time with his parents and himself as a baby. And this episode will give you whiplash because of the tonal shifts that it goes through. He almost decides to stay behind with his parents, but when his baby self throws a toy at their time machine, he is sent back. Which definitely is for the best, but heesh, talk about the trauma. Following the original theme of the game, Pac seems to suffer from some form of eating problem as highlighted by his concerned friends. It's referenced that it's actually a side effect or characteristic of being yellow, but much like me, he just can't stop eating. He lacks self-control and considering he's technically all mouth, I'm really, really curious about where it all goes, but I'm too afraid to Google that so I guess I'm not really that curious after all. Pac is a pretty positive and upbeat 
kid, but he is prone to common bad habits that come with being a kid, like putting off schoolwork or being self-centered, but that's on occasion, you know, when we gotta learn a moral or lesson or something. He is extremely kind to his friends and doesn't hesitate to save anyone or give anyone a second chance. This is evident by how quickly he was willing to give Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde a chance at redemption. Once when they surrendered, and another when they double-crossed him by luring him and his friends to betray us. The four ghosts, though, do serve different character roles. You see, you see what I did there? I, I said roles, and in the title card I wrote roles. <laughs> I, I know, I don't get paid enough to do this. Pinky, voiced by Ashley Ball, is the easy to anger but mainly sweet and ditzy pink ghost, who is constantly flirting with Pac despite his disinterest. Blinky is the red ghost, voiced by Ian James Corlett. He is dubbed the leader of the four of them and his attitude is very snarky and a little too confident for his own good. Out of the four of them, he tends to be a bit more mischievous, finding a lot of pleasure in scaring the citizens of Picopolis. Inky, voiced by Lee Takar, is really similar to Blinky in the way that he is also pretty mischievous and likes to play pranks, scaring pack people. He is blue with a much more laid back attitude and definitely has untreated ADHD, much like myself. Lastly is Clyde, voiced by Brian Drummond. Clyde is the peacekeeper of the group and is the true leader if you ask me. Although he doesn't have the most brain cells, he is responsible for a lot of their survival in many instances, kind of serving as a delegate between the ghosts and Pac's group. Pac's two friends, Cylindria and Spiral, are voiced by Andrea Libman and Sam Vincent. Cylindria, or Silly for short, plays a similar role to Pink Pinky because she also has a crush on Pac, but is different because she doesn't want to admit it. Man, Pac is really quite the ladies' man. The ladies' Pac-man. She has this hipster, goth-esque appearance, and she has proven to be one of the more intelligent members of the friend group. Spiral, on the other hand, is Pac's best friend, and has more of an athletic fashion. He is shown as sort of a protector figure for Pac due to his height, and other than that, he really doesn't have much more to stand out with his personality traits. In fact, a lot of them don't. The characters here are very one-dimensional and don't really seem to grow or evolve with the series. What you often see with a character is what you get. They try to emphasize the three of them in a found family dynamic, which is something I always love to see explored, as a way of confronting Pac when the topic of his parents come up. But really watching the series, I don't understand why they're all friends. There's no bonding moment seen or carried through episode to episode. It seems that each character was created individually because they needed a character to check every box to make sure they didn't just create Pac-Man three times over, or just have Pac-Man by himself, but I think Pac-Man working with the ghost to take down Betrayus would have worked great. Maybe something could have been done for a found family story with unlikely pairing of people or uh, ghosts and Pac people. Each episode can hold its own individually. Other than the first two episodes, which do a good job at setting up the plot for the rest of the series, there's really no reason why you would need to watch every episode in order, which does make it something that you can put on in the background and enjoy from time to time in passing. But that also defeats the purpose because one of the two most enjoyable things about the show are the clever visuals and ways that they build the pack world for the viewer. There seems to be a lot of room to expand on this pack lore, but the structure and nature of the show holds itself back from doing so, which is fine. Individual episodes and self-contained episodes are great. This is just me personally seeing more potential and fleshing out the groundwork that is here. The way that Pac-Man is treated like a common theme for everything in Pac world reminded me a lot of the wacky adventures of Ronald McDonald, a show that I did a video on earlier this year. Pac-Land does the same that McDonald Land does by making everything Pac-Man themed. There's a Pac version of every Pac thing in the Pac world, and the circle with a slice out of it motif is seen practically everywhere you look. I even own this in Fortnite. Yes, I enjoy me some Fortnite to de-stress at the end of the day. You got a problem with that, bucko? But you can see how much fun the production team had making everyone's name related to a circular shape and adding pack into various words. They speak packlish instead of English and celebrate Independence Day instead of Independence Day. But you know what is just too out of pocket for even me? Pack World War One. Yeah, you heard me right. Pack World War One. Now, I just have so many questions because the fact that they have to specify that this is the first World War means that there's at least a second Pack World War. Just think about that for a second because this rabbit hole of thought can get very weird and very dark, very very fast. It's literally all the cars lore all over again. Thanks, Hasanabi. You ruined the internet's childhoods. So let's just move on. What a f Weasley little
Liar, dude. Literally lying. The second thing I found enjoyable about the series was the villain of the story. Betrayus. He is the brother of President Spheros and the leader of the revolt that incited Pact World War One, aka the Ghost War. After his defeat, he and the men who fought for his side were stripped of their corporal bodies and sentenced to be confined to the netherworld as ghosts for the rest of their existence. Betrayus is the kind of bumbling villain that everyone loves. His incompetence makes him an entertaining enough antagonist that straight away from the typical cunning and artful manner of villain that is more common. Betrayus is very frequently outsmarted or bested by Pack due to his lack of awareness or patience. Sam Vincent does a great job at giving his voice a very recognizable evil character that also lives up to his idiocy. The series also gets bonus points in my book for the animation. For a 2013 computer animated series, it doesn't look half bad. The first two episodes, however, were great in terms of animation quality and it's clear that they spent a lot of time for this two-part premiere. Even with the quality noticeably decreasing as the show went on, it's still pretty good for the remainder of the series. But what happened to this show, this new age of Pac-Man that they were trying to overhaul for their IP? What? Breakfast! Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures will be right back. Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures now returns. Although initially rated very well, the reason that this show didn't make it past two seasons, or three depending on where you live, could possibly be the lack of sales from the content of the series itself, such as toys and video games. The various power-ups of Pac, depending on which berry he eats, already kind of felt like an excuse to make variations of Pac to make into action figures, and market to kids the fact that the series was basically made with the intention of releasing at least one game along with it. The Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures console game and a smartphone game called Pac-Man Dash, released the same year the show premiered. And the sequel to that first game, Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures 2, released the following year in 2014. Usually, people can tell they're being told a story as a marketing ploy, and the show felt like that at certain times to me. It didn't feel like there was much creativity going into the series for the most of it. However, I do like the references to the video games and the various nods or jokes to the things that made Pac-Man, Pac-Man. There is just this layer of addition to the show that isn't present in favor of maybe just having a show out there. But then again, it is a show for kids, and there's a reason why it did so well initially with its demographic. It's recognizable, it's colorful, it's got engaging action, and it's got a ton of fart jokes. But it wouldn't have been impossible to stuff in some more intelligence or some other factor to bring it above just a gateway from show to video games and toys. But the biggest crime that the show committed was the theme song of the show, and no offense to the writers and performers, of this theme song, but what in the five minutes in Crayola Crayons was this? My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. It was so disliked that nearly a decade after the show premiered, it was still getting memed about on Twitter. And if you really think about how Bandai Namco tried putting a split in the modern Pac-Man, it may show a lack of faith in the new design and direction here for Pac-Man, or one of consumer products first. Example, when it came to getting Pac-Man and Super Smash Bros for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, it was the more classic design and style of Pac-Man who was placed in the game. And now, to be fair, that was a decision from Masahiro Sakurai who preferred the original look to Pac-Man instead of the new one. And if Bandai Namco weren't going to change his look back to the original for this game, then he would have been cut out of the game completely. But the thing that really cements the point here is that Pac, right here, Paxter, as his friends call him, technically may not even be the real Pac-Man at all. Literally. At the start of this new brand refresh for Pac-Man, Pac is Pac-Man. The title of the show is Pac-Man, so we follow Pac-Man on said ghostly adventures. Easy enough to follow. Simple and makes sense. Funny thing is though, that there are many hints and notions in the show that Pac and Pac-Man are not one in the same. Speculation on why this may be comes from possibly trying to tone down the amount of dislike towards this version of Pac-Man. A way to fan down the flames on die-hard Pac-Man fans who weren't on board for the changes. Now a lot of the surface level reasons boil down to previous video games looking into the backstory of Pac-Man, but treating this strictly as a reboot, a whole new interpretation of the 
the character, the real evidence comes from a Pac-Man arcade party cabinet in the background of the cafeteria. But who knows? It could all just be the nothing, so let's treat it as such for now. Also, to me, all these other characters look like M&M's candy. So did you watch this series when you were younger? Did you watch it when you were older? I know this guy here sure did. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe with notifications on for more content like this, or I'll tell my mom you didn't let me play next on the video game. Join on and become a member of the channel to help support it. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.